just let you know that we have started recording. Um, and I believe it is just about 12 o'clock. Hopefully everyone has their lunch and we're gonna get started real soon. All right, well, thank you for joining us for the Aquatic Species of the Dan River Basin webinar today. Um, I, uh, my name is Tiffany Hayworth and I am with the Dan River Basin Association. I am just gonna talk to you just for a few seconds before we get started about DARBA. We serve 3,300 square miles, approximately 16 counties in Virginia and North Carolina. And this is our footprint right here. Um, and we do our work in three major areas, recreation, education, and stewardship. And I am not gonna go through all of these wonderful programs and projects that we are working on right now, but I do wanna invite you to visit our website, danriver.org, and spend a day or a few hours or a few minutes exploring all that we are doing. So with that being said, I am going to welcome Kelsey Roberts. Hi, Kelsey. Um, Kelsey is originally from Michigan, where she graduated from Michigan State University with a bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife. She moved to Raleigh in 2011, where she attended NC State University and received a master's degree in concert conservation biology in 2014. She has been working as a sport fish biologist with the North Carolina Wild Wars wildlife resources ever since and enjoys all things outdoors. Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen and I am going to stop my video. Okay, awesome. Ready? Can everybody see that? I mean, can you see that, Tiffany? Yes, okay, we can perfect. perfect. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> as she said, uh, I work with the Wildlife Resources Commission um, down in North Carolina. Um, just a little bit of background on what we what we do. Um, we were formed in 1947 um, with the mission to conserve and sustain the state's fish and wildlife resources through research, um, science, and public input. And so we're really responsible for all the fauna um, statewide, both aquatic and terrestrial. So um, my background specifically is in sport fish. Um, today, I, we're going to kind of break this talk into two different sections. The first is going to be non-game species that you might find in the Dan River Basin. Um, and just a disclaimer, um, you know, I got a lot of that information for the talk today from our aquatic wildlife diversity biologist. And so I will provide his information um, at the end of the talks, if you have any questions regarding the non-game um, species that I talk about today, you can uh, reach out to him at, a, at another time if I can't answer the question myself. Um, and I also just wanted to mention, you know, a lot of the species that I am talking about today, you can find both, you know, in North Carolina and Virginia. But um, Myself, I'm a North Carolina biologist, so there are some areas of the Dan River Basin that I'm not super familiar with and maybe have not seen the data on all the, the, the um, species that I might mention today. So if you have questions and you're in Virginia, um, you really want to get into some specifics, I would definitely recommend reaching out to your Virginia biologist um, regarding uh, any species in, if you live in Virginia. So um, I'm a part of the Inland Fisheries Division uh, within the Commission. We have three general programs. The uh, Aquatic Wildlife Diversity Program deals with um, endangered, threatened, and species of concern. And then I'm a part of the Game Fish Management um, Program, and we deal mostly with sport fish. So basically, if it has a regulation on it, um, I'm responsible for basically the biology that goes on behind developing and, and managing those, those regulations. Um, and the third 
third part that I won't talk about today is production. Uh, we have hatcheries that support both um, our sport fish program and the aquatic wildlife diversity program. So they're, you know, not, not just stocking um, catfish or striped bass, they also are working with the wildlife diversity program to stock some endangered species um, and, and also mussels, which we might get into a little later. So our aquatic wildlife diversity program is broken into four major ecoregions, and you can see here I circled um, just up here in the Roanoke River Basin is where the Dan River Basin falls. Um, and so the aquatic wildlife diversity program is responsible for going out there and finding all these endangered and threatened species and just really getting a good hold on where their populations are and where they might be able to reintroduce um, certain populations. And so, you know, how do, how do they get their hands on the fish, right? Well, electrofishing is a big part of their job. Um, up here in the right hand uh, top picture, you can see we've got a barge electrofisher going. Um, and this is a really labor intensive way to find um, smaller species in, in rivers that you can't get like a, a motor boat into. Um, and we also have backpack electrofishers um, down here on the bottom left. And um, another way that they catch both fish and crayfish are um, to use this, this same net. So basically someone will stand upstream of this net um, and kind of kick the water around and, and see what flows into um, the net. And so that's a really good way to catch crayfish and, and small species as well. Um, and they also will do snorkeling surveys. So they'll go, there are some species that are really a lot easier to find via snorkeling because they don't move much or they like to you know, hang out in very specific habitats. And this is also a good way to find, um, to find mussels. So before I get into kind of um, what species are out there, I just wanted to go over a few terms that I'll be using um, just so you guys know what they are. Um, so a stream order, this is a way for us to measure um, the size of a stream where the first through the third order streams are your headwater, smaller, um, you know, more narrower streams. So you know, for instance, where two first order streams come together, that's gonna give you a second order stream. And then where two second order streams come together, you get a third order stream and so on and so on. Um, and the, the larger the number, basically the, the wider and larger the river system is. I'll also be talking a little bit about riverine habitats. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar um, with these three different habitats, especially if you're kayaking or you know bank angling. Um, but there's a million different ways to categorize habitats and these are just sort of the three main ways. Um, so you've got a riffle run in a pool and as you go down from a riffle to a pool, um, the current gets a lot slower, the um, substrate gets a lot smaller and um, the river system gets deeper. And so based on you know, where fish have different adaptations to be able to live in, in each of these different um, habitats. You know, for instance, a riffle is so fast, such fast moving water that a lot of times you have to have special adaptations to be able to kind of hunker down in that, in that fast current and, and be able to stay within the rocks. Whereas a pool is so slow moving that it's oftentimes um, an area for fish to go to rest but it's also where um, predators hang out. So you kind of have to risk um, getting some rest versus maybe getting eat, eaten in the pools. Um, okay, so the first kind of group that I wanted to talk about today is crayfish. Um, and, and I just wanted to have a disclaimer that by no means is what the species that I'll talk about today an exhaustive list of what's available and, and present in each of these river systems. Um, these, these three crayfish are just some of the most common ones. Um, so crayfish are really unique and they, um, you know, play a special role in the ecosystem. 
they, one cool fact about crayfish is that they, um, the females will carry their eggs um, on their abdomen and even after they hatch, they'll still carry their larvae for a period of time until they're ready to swim away. Um, I'm sure some of you have, have seen crayfish molting or maybe caught a crayfish after it's uh, done molting that's really soft. And so they have this um, unique way of of growing and in, in where they have to shed their their exoskeleton um, every so often, especially you know more often during the earlier years in order to be able to grow. And so they have periods of time where they're really vulnerable to predation. Um, so the three common ones in um, the Gamma River Basin are the Caroline ladle crayfish. This can be found in your smaller order streams, um, intermittent waterways. They usually like to be um, in rocks. Some of them burrow. Um, so if you, you know, pick up rocks, sometimes you'll see them swim away. Um, the Atlantic slope crayfish, these can be found in mid-order streams, primarily in gravel riffles. So like I said, if you find some rocks and you kind of kick them around, you might, you might get to see a crayfish. Um, and they also, also they come out at night. So they're really you know, easier to see maybe with like a flashlight at night, just kind of roaming around. Um, and this last species is the Dan River Canberra species C. And this is currently an undescribed species. So we're in the process of um, describing this as a new species. And this can be found in second order streams to large rivers. Our second um, group is the darters. These are, um, fish that are very small, they can fit in the palm of your hand, um, and they typically require really clean water and are found kind of in faster moving water usually um, in first through third order streams. So they're gonna be a little harder to find as you get into the bigger rivers. Um, and they kind of, you know, hang out in the rocks and eat, um, you know, any insects they can find and crustaceans and things like that. Um, but one cool thing about darters is that they, it's because they require such clean water, we can actually use surveys of darters, among other things, um, as a bio indication of water quality. So if you're in an area and you're not seeing you know, any darters, um, and among other things, uh, you know, it can be an indication that there's something going on with the water quality of their pollution or, you know, the water's too turbid. Um, and we can kind of classify different streams based on what um, species we're finding that require that clean water. So um, this glassy darter up top can be found in pools and runs. The chainback darter can be found mostly in runs. And then these three, um, the last three can be found in riffles. And so you can see, especially this river weed darter down here in the bottom, it has such large pectoral fins and those are basically to help it anchor down and, and be able to, um, you know, survive and thrive in, in riffles. So the Dan River Basin is uh, home to a federally endangered log perch, the Roanoke log perch. Um, and if you're wondering what the difference between the federally listed and the state listed species are, um, federally listed species are um, fish or mussels or you know, crayfish that have um, federal protection. And so they have additional monitoring and research and, and funding for protection. Um, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also responsible for monitoring these species in addition to state agencies. Um, so the Roanoke log perch, uh, it likes medium to large size, warm, clear streams. And you'll find it in riffles, runs, and pools as long as there's sand, gravel, and, and boulder. Um, the location, you can find these in Dan River upstream of the Lindsay, Lindsay Bridge Dam and in some lower Smith and Mayo River, and a handful of tributaries um, in Rockingham County, North Carolina. Um, so if you see one, let us know. The next group is the suckers. Um, typically, I think when people think of suckers, they think of large, you know, fish jumping out of the water, um, 
kind of like these not the red horses down here. There's actually a wide variety of um, sizes of suckers. Um, specifically, we've got um, the Roanoke hog sucker and the big eyed jump rack. And these are smaller suckers that can fit in the palm of your hands. And so they're going to be found in the second and third order streams, um, but they can also be found in some of the larger rivers. Um, they occupy runs and pools. And the cool thing about these two is that you can only find them in the Dan River Basin. So they're endemic to that area. And the Roanoke hog sucker is classified as significantly rare for North Carolina. So it's not quite threatened or endangered yet, but it's a species that we're, that we're keeping an eye on. The Notchalik red horse, um, you can find these in second and third order streams. They're mostly present, um, prevalent in the lower Dan River Basin. Um, and you can find them in runs and pools. The V-lip red horse and the Quillback, you can only find these in larger rivers. So they're gonna be in the lower basin um, downstream of Danbury. And Quillbacks are, again, something that we were, a species that we're keeping an eye on. We do have it classified as um, significantly rare for North Carolina. So here's another little sucker that can fit in, in your hand. Um, the rusty side sucker, this is one that is classified as endangered for North Carolina, but it hasn't quite, um, you know, is not federally listed as endangered. And um, you can only find this uh, fish in the upper Little Dan River, basically at the Virginia state line. And it's extremely rare. We've only found um, two of them in the last 10 years. Our next group of fish is, are the shiners. This is a very large um, group of fish. So it's basically uh, shiners, chubs, and minnows. Um, and these are gonna be found in your uh, runs and pools, not so much the riffles. Um, and they can be found basically anywhere. So second and third order streams all the way up into larger rivers, as long as you have you know, the right habitat. Um, the red lip shiner is very common. Uh, it's used oftentimes as bait. Here's a picture of it here, done here on the left, um, swimming with the crescent shiners. Um, the blue head chub, something interesting about that fish is that um, it's also called, some people call it a horny head chub. And I don't know if you can see um, on this picture, but when they're mating or during spawning season, they'll grow these uh, horns on their heads and they'll turn this bright blue color. And so they're really a beautiful fish, um, especially during spawning time. So more shiners. Um, up here we have the white shiner. This is probably one of the most common shiners that you might find. And again, um, people oftentimes use it for bait. Um, in most of these, like I said, you're gonna find in first through third order streams into larger rivers. Uh, the cutlet minnow down here, this is a species of concern for us in North Carolina. Um, and this is something that we can only find in the Dan River Basin. So there's a lot of fish that are endemic to the Dan River Basin, which makes it such a unique system. Um, here is the Blue Ridge Sculpin. Um, this is another species that's of concern, and it has these huge pectoral fins um, that allow it to kind of hunker down and, and live in riffles. And this, this is another species that if, if you don't have clean water, um, it's going to be really difficult to find. It's very sensitive to changes in the environment. Um, and you can only find them in the upper Dan River upstream of Danbury. So the freshwater drum, this is another species of special concern. Um, this, this I caught electrofishing when we were looking for striped bass one year on the Dan River near Milton. Um, and it's actually not uh, native to this side of the state in North Carolina. Um, it's native to the Mississippi River Basin. And one thing I just wanted to you know, briefly touch on is the difference between, um, you know, non-native versus invasive. I feel like we use those terms a lot. Um, in a non-native fish, um, in terms of management, is a fish that 
has been introduced but doesn't really affect the native fish. So they're not really out competing. They might, you know, they're not eating all the native fish. They're not having all these negative effects and they're not really, um, you know, overpopulating whatever system they get into. Compared to the invasive species, um, when they get into a system, they completely invade, they take over, and you start to see declines in some of your native species. And so the, those are species that we would, um, you know, classify as invasive and, and harmful um, to native species. So the, this freshwater drum, it's not considered to be invasive, but it, it is not native. Um, and you can find them in large rivers uh, or sandy lakes, um, mostly in the lower river basin. Um, and one cool thing about uh, freshwater drum is that they get their name by contracting their swim bladders and making this like loud, um, deep drumming noise. And so if you ever catch one, um, you might get to hear it kind of talk to you. And that's that drumming noise is where they get their name. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, mussels. Um, mussels are really, really an important part of the ecosystem. They are filter feeders, so they're constantly removing um, particles and nutrients and things from the water column. And so they, um, you know, they're responsible sometimes for that clean, pristine water that you might see um, in some of the upper order streams. They, um, you know, are also a food source um, for many species. And one interesting fact about mussels is that they have a parasitic life cycle. So when they have their larvae, their larvae need a very specific species of fish usually. Um, and they attach to that fish's gills and they have a, a, a small cycle where that's how they survive and they feed on fish's gills. And so if those fish are not present in the system, then it makes it harder for mussels um, to reproduce if they require a specific fish. And so sometimes mussels will have um, this structure that will come out and sort of attract that very specific type of fish. And when the fish comes over to, you know, try to eat whatever the attractant looks like, the mussels will release all their babies um, and they'll attach to the fish. So, you know, they may, they may look like just rocks, but they are much more than that um, and they play a very important role. So, I, I can't get into all the mussels that are present today, but I will say that mussels are some of them, are the most imperiled group of um, aquatic organisms. Um, and so there are three um, in the Dan River Basin that are considered endangered for North Carolina. We've got the yellow lamp mussel and the Atlantic pig toe. And these can be found in the lower Dan River um, downstream of the Smith River confluence. Um, there's also the green floater down here on the um, bottom left. And this is present in larger rivers, sort of like the Dan and the Mayo River. And uh, there is one federally listed endangered species in the Dan River Basin, the James spiny mussel. Um, and this can be found in the upper Dan and Mayo rivers in the pockets of the lower Dan River. And one interesting thing I just wanted to mention that the Wildlife Resources Commission does is we have a whole um, mussel hatchery right now that um, recently we've um, been growing and um, stocking endangered and threatened species in North Carolina. So, you know, it's not like when we go and stock striped bass where you just back the truck into the lake or the river and you just release, you know, dump a bunch of fish in the water and they survive and they're fine. Um, with mussels, when they have to stock them, they take literally thousands of mussels and individually have to place them in the sand so that they're right side up in the perfect amount of depth in the sand so that they can survive. And then they'll go back the next year and see how many of them survived, if any of them moved, and things like that. And so that's one interesting thing that um, the commission is doing to kind of, um, you know, help certain mussel species out in North Carolina. 
Okay, so that was the non-game part of the talk. Now we're moving into um, sport fish, which is what I specialize in. Uh, North Carolina, we have um, we've broken our uh, state into nine districts. And so I am a part of District 5. And you can see um, Rockingham, Caswell, and Person. These are kind of the three um, counties that I manage where the Dan River Basin dips into. So the way we get our hands on fish is a little different. Um, we usually are focusing on lakes and larger rivers um, because that's where you're going to find the sport fish and that's where most, um, most of our constituents for sport fish are fishing. Um, so we have these large electrofisher boats that we use. We also have um, trap nets up here on the top left. And then we also use gill nets. Um, and we can kind of tailor when and where and what we're using to be able to catch um, exactly what type of fish we're, we're looking for. So for example, this is a trap net. And um, basically all of these fish in the bottom of this net are all crappy and, the, and so we have very little bycatch usually um, and we're able to catch a lot of fish uh, at one time so that we can properly assess different populations throughout the state and make sure that our regulations are doing their job. So the first um, group that I'll talk about today are the temperate bass. Um, the first one is striped bass. So here on the top, that is a striped bass that we caught um, in the Dan River near Milton a few years ago. Um, you can catch really big females as they're making their migrations to try to spawn. Um, and these, these are a stock species, so they most likely would not be here if um, Virginia was not stocking them into Carr Lake. Um, so these can mostly be found in the lower basin and you can catch them in the rivers um, during their spawning runs, uh, usually in April, mid to late April. White bass, these are another uh, common Maroni species. They are present in a lot of lakes. They're actually not native to um, this side of the state, um, but they are considered a game fish nonetheless. Um, so there is a regulation that we have on them and they're very popular uh, especially in the springtime because they will make migrations up into the rivers from the lakes and you can catch a ton of them at once um, and they're just super fun to catch. Um, so the last species is hybrid striped bass and that's a cross between white bass and striped bass and these are also a non-native stocked species that's also sterile. So we do that because we want to, we make them sterile because well, they, they are naturally sterile because they're a hybrid, but um, it allows us an extra layer of protection when we're stocking them into lakes. So say something, you know, so say they had a negative impact on, on, a, on a species that we didn't see coming, we could always just stop stocking them and they would cease to exist in that system. So we recently started stocking hybrid striped bass into Heiko Lake which is one of the lakes um, in the lower part of the basin. So I think we've been stocking them for two years now. Um, and I would say that probably by next year, you should be able to catch uh, some pretty decent sized hybrids um, and we'll continue to do that. Our next um, group of fish is the black bass. Most of you are probably familiar with this species. Um, Largemouth bass, they're, they're warm water species, um, so they're going to be really common in lakes and rivers, most likely are going to be thriving um, in areas where the water is warmer, so more of the lower, lower river basin. Um, and they're fun to catch because, you know, obviously they get really big, but they have uh, different seasonal movement and feeding patterns that, um, you know, anglers will it's all, you know, kind of a guessing game when you go out there to, to see, you know, where and how you're going to catch these, these fish because it just differs every time you go out to the lake. Um, then there's smallmouth bass. So these are 
kind of opposite. They're cool water species. They like clear water, um, cool water, lakes and rivers. So you're mostly going to find thriving populations uh, that'll be more common in the upper river basin. Our next um, group of fish are the catfish. These are some of my favorite fish because um, I just think they're really cool and unique and they also uh, have the ability to talk to you kind of like the drum does except for um, they actually rub their pectoral uh, spine against their pectoral girdle or girdle to to make sort of like a chirping noise so i don't know if any of you have ever heard that if you've caught a catfish but it's one of one of the reasons they're one of my favorite groups of fish um, so the channel catfish this is uh, another that's not native, but is managed um, by our uh, by the commission, and um, and it's actually stocked by the commission in some of our community fishing programs because they just they can survive in any kind of condition, especially the hot summers down here in the Piedmont. Um, but they live in a wide variety of habitats, uh, rivers, ponds, and streams. You can pretty much find these guys everywhere. Um, the white catfish is one of our uh, only native catfish uh, and again it lives in a wide variety of habitats and then you have bullhead catfish and I didn't list them all here um, just some common ones and these are also native and um, the way you can tell the difference between a white catfish and a bullhead is that the white catfish will have a forked tail and the, the bullheads will have more of a flat, um, they won't have any fork in their tail. It might be like a slight indent, but it certainly won't be fork. So that's one way to tell them apart. So the next group of catfish, um, I think a lot of people, or at least, you know, myself included, picture catfish as being these larger fish, but there's actually a subgroup that is really small and can fit in the palm of your hand, um, the mad toms. Uh, so the orange fin mad tom is considered endangered for um, in North Carolina. It occupies really uh, fast ripples and it uh, requires clean water. And you can find these in the upper Dan River upstream of Danbury. Uh, and it's only found in the Dan River in North Carolina. So this is a special species. But if you do find one, um, one thing that mad toms uh, have, in, have in common is that they, uh, they can sting you with their pectoral spine. So if you catch one, you have to be really careful. Um, first time I ever handled one, I did not know this and I got stung a bunch of times on my hands. Um, so I learned really quickly that these little guys pack a big punch. Um, they may be small, but they're, they're mighty. So the margin mad tom, this is one of the most common ones. If you're trying to find a mad tom, um, this is probably what you're gonna find. Um, they're in ripples and runs, and again, they require clean, clean water. Um, and you can find them everywhere from first order, tiny trickle streams uh, to bigger rivers. They're the most common catfish in, in the Dan River Basin. All right, so now we've got um, trout. And I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, in my district, I don't deal with trout populations. Um, those are more toward the Western Carolina. So I'm also not super familiar with um, the trout populations in Virginia, but I, I just wanted to briefly mention them because, you know, they are such cool fish and, and they do occur um, in the upper basins of, of the Dan River. Um, these these pictures here are from some of my personal trips out west, um, the Western Carolina mountains to, to catch trout. Um, so brook trout are the only native species of trout and they are actually um, a char. So they're not a true trout. And the difference between trout and um, char is that the um, char have light spots, whereas the um, trout have darker spots. So that's one way you can tell the um, char from the, from the trout. So brook trout, these require really clean, um, well oxygenated water. And so you're really only going to find these in the, the headwater streams, like up in the mountains. Um, 
if you go lower down in the river basin, um, they just are less and less common. They require silt-free gravel in order to spawn, and they really like a lot of in-stream cover, such as logs and boulders. Um, so like I said, you can find these in the upper Dan River Basin. Rainbow trout um, and brook, or brown trout are both a stocked species. Um, we stock them here in uh, North Carolina as well as in Virginia. Um, and they can handle a lot um, poor water quality. Uh, we actually will stock rainbow trout in Piedmont um, ponds because they just make a really excellent, um, you know, fish for people who aren't able to make it out to the mountains. They can survive in these, these ponds um, throughout the winter um, before summer hits and, and usually kids, you know, love to catch them and they're just a really great fish. Um, but they can, they can grow uh, quite large, uh, especially if they are socked into um, lakes. And the brown trout, they again like, uh, really like a lot of underwater structures such as fallen trees and undercut banks. Another popular um, game fish are sunfish. There's a ton of different species that I could mention here, but I just wanted to highlight a few. So um, black crappie and white crappie are you know, some of the more common um, species to fish for in, in lakes, but also certain times of the year um, in rivers, they can be found kind of chasing shad um, and you can catch them really good in rivers. One cool thing about uh, sunfish is that they hybridize a lot with each other. So um, black crappie and white crappie will hybridize, um, pumpkin seed and bluegill will hybridize. And so if you catch a fish and you're not really quite sure what it is, um, it, it could it could be a hybrid for sure. Um, and, and these fish are really uh, warm water species like bass um, and they can be found, you know, basically everywhere. So here's one cool fish that um, is endemic to uh, the Roanoke River Basin. Um, and you can find them in the Mayo and Smith Rivers in the Dan River Basin. And they are classified as a significantly rare um, species and they're, they're a type of rock bass. Um, and <clears throat> if you're interested in fishing for them, usually if you can find um, a riffle or a run and there's large boulders, they love sitting just behind those large boulders or just in like a pool downstream of where the fast current is, is coming off. Um, and so this is, this is another neat species that um, it can't, it can be found in a few other um, rivers in North Carolina, but um, this is one of the rivers, one of the river basins that it's endemic to. All right, so there are probably more fish that I could talk about today, um, but I, I just wanted to briefly, or maybe not so briefly, get into uh, invasive species. This is, um, invasive species are, is something that is, you know, very prevalent today in fisheries management. Um, <clears throat> it's something that once they're introduced, they have the ability to just completely alter ecosystems um, and so it's really hard for us to manage for invasive species once they get into a river system. And so we're trying to educate people on, you know, stopping the spread of invasive species before they get into different river systems. So two of the ones that are very common in this area are the flathead catfish, um, which is up here on the top uh, right. And these inhabit deep, slow stretches. So they really, really like deep pools and rivers, and they hide under logs and brush, um, riprap rip or underwater piles of debris. Um, they're very voracious predators. They eat a lot of fish. Uh, blue catfish, these um, prefer faster currents, so they kind of occupy slightly different niches in rivers, um, but they can also both uh, occupy lakes. And, you know, some people might think, well, these are, look how big these are. These would be so much fun to catch. Um, a lot of people love them and we totally understand that. Um, they are a very large fish and I'm sure they would be really fun to catch. Um, but the problem is, is they go from being this 
you know, maybe the size of your hand to being able to eat your entire arm. Um, and they, you know, it takes a lot of fish to feed, um, to feed this mouth here, right? Um, and so one of the things that they do is they, especially these two crayfish, or cray, these two sport fish, they, um, or invasive fish, sorry, they prey on native um, catfish. So whenever they get into a river system, they essentially wipe out all the native catfish. So you won't see bullheads or white catfish anymore. Um, and especially on the coast, when they're in coastal river systems, they feed heavily on um, anadromous fish such as um, you know, American shad, hickory shad, um, the blueback herring, alewives, and so they really have this ability to kind of decimate, decimate um, native populations. Another invasive species that we're dealing with right now is spotted bass um, or Alabama bass. Um, these species have been kind of making their way throughout uh, the state here in North Carolina um, and in Virginia, and they like clear water. Um, and one thing that uh, happens with spotted bass is once they get introduced, they um, they grow really fast, and you know they have a really good fisheries for about five to ten years. Um, and after that because they grow so fast and they reproduce so fast, they become overpopulated uh, really quickly, which makes them stunted. And you just get this sort of mediocre um, population in the end. Doesn't, doesn't usually stay awesome for that long. Um, and one thing that spotted bass do is, you know, usually once they're introduced, we see a decline in um, native uh, largemouth bass species. And they also have a tendency to hybridize with smallmouth bass because their, their you know, habitats overlap more frequently than with largemouth bass. Um, and so they have this tendency to affect reproduction and the genetics of sm smallmouth um, in many systems. So in general, we, we like to discourage um, moving any of these species, especially if you're even if you're just trying to take it back to your own private pond, um, you know, that's how a lot of species get introduced because ponds flood and, and usually you have, you know, some type of outflowing stream where fish can make their way into the next lake or, or river system. Um, so we would just, you know, like to encourage people to not spread these species um, around. So I just wanted to mention tilapia because um, they are technically classified as invasive, um, but due to their cold water, they don't have a cold water tolerance. They um, tend to stick where the water is warmer so they don't spread um, outside of uh, where they've been introduced. So um, you can find these in Heiko Lake down, I have it circled here on the Dan River Basin map. And these were accidentally introduced um, a while ago, but because this is a thermal heated power plant um, effluent lake, um, they can survive in the lake, um, but they probably wouldn't be able to survive elsewhere. But nonetheless, they're still, um, you know, detrimental to the, the populations that are in Heiko Lake. They basically ate um, all the vegetation in Heiko within a few years of being introduced. Um, and they were just very disruptive. Uh, so we, we hypothesize that they impact, um, you know, spawning during the springtime by just kind of, you know, messing up the shoreline and the turbidity and everything along the, um, where like bass and some fish are, are spawning. But if you wanted to fish for them, um, they are in the Dan River Basin and you can find them in Heiko. So the last one I wanted to talk about is hydrilla. Um, these are present in some of the lakes um, in the Dan River Basin. Uh, and you know, this is a picture of the Eno River in North Carolina. And you can see that once they get into a system, they just, it, it, or they, the plants, they just completely take over. And so, you know, if you're trying to paddle this river, all of a sudden it becomes very difficult. It makes them, essentially non-navigable. Um, and then, you know, the, un the other consequences is that it 
chokes out native vegetation. It completely alters, you know, what types of fish can live there. Um, alters the nutrients that are, you know, in the water columns. Sometimes it can alter flow regimes. Um, so it's just generally a really terrible plant. It's federally listed as a noxious plant. Um, so if you are ever in a lake or an area where this plant is present, um, the best way to prevent spread is to just, um, you know, check your boots, check your waders, and check your boat for any, um, you know, pieces of plant hanging off because all it takes is just a few segments of plant um, and it can completely take over a system. So some of the other things um, that, you know, could be impacting some of these rare or uh, threatened species um, is nutrient runoff or uh, pollution from things like fertilizing your lawn, um, agricultural practices, uh, just general, um, you know, acute uh, sources of pollution, people dumping things into the water. Um, disease is another one. Uh, in North Carolina, we recently got uh, whirling's disease and gill lice um, infecting some of our trout populations. And these can be completely detrimental to trout populations. And once it's in a system, it essentially never goes away. Um, and so just you know, learning how to prevent the spread of disease when you're out there kayaking or um, wading and fishing um, is really important to, to help some of these populations. Um, habit, habitat degradation is really important, um, either from development, fracking, drilling, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of these species are very uh, sensitive to changes in their environment. And so if all of a sudden there's no trees, you know, shading the river. It might be too hot for things like trout. Um, or, you know, say a river, someone's putting in a subdivision really close to a spot where um, some endangered mussels live or uh, threatened mussels live. That silt from the, um, the construction can go into the river and kind of really disrupt uh, their ability to survive. So that's really important um, to just be conscious of um, you know, where you're building things and how it might affect the river systems around you. Um, the last thing is um, river passage barriers. So this is, this is important more so maybe for coastal river systems where you have um, fish that really need long periods of uninterrupted river to spawn. But it is important still, especially the further up you go in a, in a river basin, um, to just kind of, you know, try to find ways to help the fish get past some of the barriers um, if it's going to help their population. So some of the things that um, you can do if you liked what you heard today and you want to, um, you know, get a little more involved and learn a little bit more about um, some of the endangered or threatened species, the best thing that you can do is just educate yourself and others, um, you know, by learning more about these amazing critters, um, learning more about how you can, you know, use that the best recreational practices that you can do to prevent the spread of disease or um, aquatic hitchhikers, such as invasive species, um, you know, participate in your local cleanups. I know there's, you know, maybe not so many going on now with everything, but, um, you know, if you support your local initiatives, uh, in your local associations like the Dan River Basin Association, um, they have a lot of outreach and things that you can get involved with. Um, and lastly, you can prevent the spread of invasive species by simply just speaking up. Um, you can go on our website or Virginia's website and find the enforcement officer for the enforcement officer's number for whatever area you're fishing in. And if you see something that is illegal or um, you know that someone's maybe transporting fish or doing something illegal you can just give them a call that's what they're there for we are a public resource and um you know we can't be everywhere at once so if you know you have our number then um you can definitely give us a call anytime so bottom line just want to wrap up um dan river basin is an awesome unique just like very variable river system. It's home to a wide variety of habitats and species. You can, 
you can, you know, fish for mountain trout and then also striped bass if you wanted to and everything in between. Um, and it's home to several federally listed endangered species, uh, as well as species that you can only find in the Dan River Basin. So with that, I just want to provide my contact information. Um, like I said, we are a public resource. If you do have any questions, um, you can always give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, TR is the aquatic wildlife diversity biologist and he um, can answer any of your questions about mussels, crayfish, or non-game species um, if, I, if I can. So with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us today. That was amazing. Awesome. Um, no problem. I definitely learned a lot. And Kelsey's information that's on the screen right now uh, will be available on the DARPA website when we post the video um, for people to, to be able to contact you. Um, we did have a question during your presentation. Someone asked, how big and how much did it weigh the cat, the invasive catfish. You showed a picture that looked like it was in the back of a pickup truck and oh yeah, nine hundred pounds. How big was that? Oh, that one was about um, sixty five pounds, and we caught that one in the Noose River. So that one wasn't in the Dan River Basin, but that's a good. Um, I wanted to mention that both the state records for blue cats and um, Flathead catfish were broken this year. Um, the blue cat, someone caught a 121 pound, nine ounce blue cat in Lake Gaston um, and a 78 pound, 14 ounce flathead. So they get really big. Absolutely. Does any, if you, I have a question for Kelsey before we um, click off, you can go either in the Q and A box or the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen and we'll wait just a few minutes to see if anything comes up. Otherwise, thank you, Kelsey, for joining us. Thank you, participants, for coming and spending your lunch hour with us, learning something new. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, I'm looking at the screen. I don't see any questions coming in. So, oh, yep. <laughs> People are... Um, saying that they enjoyed. Kelsey, you have your um, Q&A chat box open. So you can uh, see what, um, well, thank you everyone. And I see, yep. Um, have a great day and we'll talk to you. We have another webinar coming up the last Wednesday of September. It is gonna be very cool learning how to do um, nature photography. And everyone stay safe. Go outdoors and enjoy what we have to offer in the Dan River Basin. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Kelsey. Have a great yeah, day. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, you too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.